Hello! I am a space cowboy today and we are going to talk about the science of sci-fi. So, we have the force here, over here. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's the actual force and so we're going to talk a little bit about the science of sci-fi. So, beam me up Scotty and today I am a space cowgirl. Space cowboy, cowgirl, it doesn't really matter now, does it? So, let's talk a bit about the science of sci-fi. So here we go. Sci-fi, what is this? Science, it's a problem-solving process that gives us lovely things that we get to play with all day. Our smartphones, this sort of thing. And then we have Fi. The Fi part of that is fiction. It's made up stories, but that's okay because we like fiction. So sci-fi is essentially science fiction. So we've got a lot of different things to talk about today in regards to the possibilities of science fiction. So hey, I finally figured out how to work this. You know, be like, <laughs> I got a lot. I got pretty far on that one. So yeah. So yeah, this is my space gun. So. Yeah, you know, hey, why not? So let's talk a little bit about <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the different types of sci-fi films we got. We got Star Wars, Stan, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, Aliens. There's debate about which one's better, Alien or Aliens. It's hard to say. World War Z, and then we got Doctor Who, The Martian, Jurassic Park, and Gattaca. So I'm going to talk about these various films a little bit, some of them, and the possibilities involving the, what we could get from this in regards to science. So, real science. Do we have real science in sci-fi? Well, yes and no. We can have both sometimes, yeah, but a lot of no, I'm afraid. So let's talk a little bit about a few of the things that are no. So Star Wars, Star Wars, whole lot of no there. We do have the force, but that's mass times acceleration. So let's talk a little bit about lightsabers. Boom. All right, so lightsabers. This is my lightsaber here. I think this is Mace Windu's lightsaber, actually. So we got lightsabers. Um, the problem is, when we're dealing with lightsabers, we got lasers, we can actually use crystals to take these particular lasers and concentrate them to where we have a laser beam. But the problem is we don't have anything more than a glorified flashlight. All right, so we have a glorified flashlight involving with a laser because when you turn the lights on, you don't see the lasers anymore. So if you have two particular lightsabers that have these laser beams shooting out of them like that, you know, you're not going to have any kind of contact. They're going to pass through one another because essentially that's what laser is. It's light. So much like the light passing through a window, but in a particular beam. But the thing is, is you're not going to be able to see them if you turn on the light. So the only way you could fight with lasers as if they're in the dark. So there's no way right now that we have to give any kind of mass in, on a tangible way to cause any kind of damage to another um, individual in a form of a weapon in regards to lasers and that kind of power would not fit in a handy little end. So really they would just be glorified flashlights if you're talking about lightsabers. Because <laughs> essentially it is just light. So, yeah, once the lights go out, you can't see them. I mean, once the lights come on, you can't see them anymore. You'd have to fight in the dark constantly. So that's the problem we have in regards to lightsabers for Star Wars. But, you know, hey, we can still try, can't we? So, um, and I will say as an aside, problem I had, especially with like Attack of the Clones, there's this scene where you have this ship that's coming into the atmosphere and they say, we've lost gravitational force in the ship and people just start sliding, you know, down like elevator shafts and stuff. I'm like, but if you lost gravity, wouldn't everybody be floating? So, so sometimes science ruins films for me. In a little bit, and I get that. That's okay. That's so Star Wars is still fun. You have to suspend disbelief and say, Well, in this world, that physics don't matter. So, but it's still a fun thing. I do want to talk now about Prometheus. Oh my god, this film. Prometheus is just what I like to call the worst scientists ever. Okay, 
So at the end of Prometheus, we have the xenomorph that's born, you know, that went from a particular one type of species into a separate, completely different type of species. That is not how evolution works. <laughs> you don't have all of a sudden a brand new species coming out of a previous species that's that different. We don't see that, all right? So that's a bit problematic. Um, and, and why I say it's the worst scientist ever. This was a trillion dollar expedition. Trillions of dollars went into this particular expedition and go to this planet that harbored life. The scientists get there and the first thing they do is they're like, wow, this atmosphere is just like Earth. They take off their helmets. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh my gosh, do they not know that there's microbes? There could be bacteria. What if there's viruses? How do they know that there's not any kind of microorganisms that would cause them to be sick? War of the Worlds. That's what killed all of the aliens that were coming to attack the planet. The common cold. So I'm sitting here going, they really haven't thought this through, have they? This is a trillion dollar expedition and they took some of the dumbest scientists I've ever seen ever in the history of film and they have an android there, right? That's kind of like Bishop from the Aliens film. And he, what does he do? He walks around and he touches all the gooey stuff. That's, that's oozing from the walls. So you got this a, this android that's like touching. He's like, all this gooey stuff right here. And the scientists are going, hmm, yes, that's interesting. And then rather than bottling it up and putting him in quarantine, they're just like, let's just carry, carry that in. I mean, it's like the equivalent of licking the spoon in the lab. I don't quite understand how these were actual scientists with PhDs because that's biology lab 101. You don't, you don't lick the spoon. So everything they did there, I, I just couldn't get past that. That made it, oh, that was the most non-science, and they claimed to be like a science, it's based in science, you know, and you're like, no, no. So what my recommendation is just watch Aliens, uh, either the first one or the second one. There's a lot of debate about which one's better. I, you know, I think, I don't know, I kind of like Aliens with the S, that's a, that's a really good story. But the thing is, is this is possible. And, and I, the reason why I say it's possible is we don't know how life progresses on other potentially life-bearing planets. So the atmosphere will have a lot to do with it. The type of cellular respiration. They may undergo a different type of cellular respiration. If the atmosphere is primarily methane, we may get different looking type of organisms. But that doesn't mean it's not possible. All we got to go on right now is our own little planet and we have oxygen-based cellular respiration, which allows us to have a lot of energy which allows us to be more um, involved in complicated and complex type of organisms like humans and such. So, in regards to this particular type of um, xenomorphs, it's entirely possible that there's another planet that has things like this on it. And it does depend on whatever the path of evolution was with that particular planet in order to generate those sorts of things. Yeah, it's fair enough. Now, we would have to overcome a few things in order to get involved into deep space travel. That would have to be, you know, the cryogenics, being able to sleep for a long time and be preserved, you know. And in addition to that, NASA and um, worked heavily with a year in space. Another problem, especially that's go going to be encountered with the Mars mission, is the degeneration of tissue, the atrophy, not really degeneration, but the atrophy of tissue bone loss and muscle mass loss. And so whenever um, somebody spends a long period of time in space, it's without gravity. And gravity is kind of essential for us to maintain our muscles and our bone density. So if we're in space, we don't have that pressure of gravity on us. So when you come back to the planet, you're now being subjected to gravity. You have to be extra careful because of the fact you don't have the muscle mass you used to have. This is why astronauts have to exercise every day to try to minimize. They still have bone density loss and they also have muscle atrophy, but the exercise allows them to, main, to minimize that. It's where it's not so bad. But you notice a lot of astronauts cannot walk when they come back to Earth, especially after a long stint in space because they've lost a lot of that muscle mass. Also, heart issues. You got to think about that. One of the things that allow us to have good, strong cardiovascular types of, um, you know, our good, strong heart is exercise. Now, what do we do? 
we run, we have cardiovascular exercise, but that's all going against gravity. So that's important as well, cardiovascular health. So that's something that would have to be overcome, but aliens, there's some possible science in that. Now we're gonna talk about World War Z, zombie films. Now as a biology teacher, I actually did have a zombie unit um, that I that I taught in my class talking about the potential of zombies. Is it possible or not? Well, reanimation of dead tissue, not so much. And if we had a zombie apocalypse that involved reanimation of dead tissue, then it would probably be over in about two weeks because we have things called bacteria and predators. So that's something, and also we have climate change and we have like you know, torrential type of weather. So really, if we had the reanimation of dead tissue and we had people walking around that were zombies, that were dead and now all of a sudden they're alive, they would be subjected to rot by bacteria. They would also be subjected to bears, wolves, rabid dogs, pick something that would come along and rip them apart. And then if you're like in Kansas, for instance, all you need is a really good tornado to wipe out a whole bunch of them or a hurricane to rip them apart. So that's the problem with um, a lot of that. You, we can't really reanimate dead tissue because of the fact also there's biochemical processes that have started to start to degenerate and take those particular elements that make our cells apart slowly, you know, as far as the molecules. So we got bond breaking. Now, what is possible? A virus. A virus that makes us a little bit woo, behave odd and altered in the form of, I don't know, we got things called prions. We could also have a virus, especially we could have like it inhaled. Your scent, the scent area of your brain is attached to your memories. So if we had a virus that could enter into your nose and alter that particular per part of your brain where you have your memories, you could forget your family members. We also could have um, an alteration in the brain involving um, cravings of, for um, human flesh. You know, that could be a thing. We could have a thing that does that. Anything that alters your mind to where you behave more like a zombie could actually happen and a virus could very well be generated in order to do that. We already have some odd behaviors from individuals, especially with prions. Those are proteins that um, form that are in your brain and the bad ones cause the good ones to change shape, which then can trigger a lot of different brain cell death going on in your head. So we alter the tissue like the frontal lobe, which is your reasoning and rationale. If we alter that a bit, then we could have conceivably higher amounts of aggression and anger and irrational behavior. So in that regard, that's possible. That's a possibility. Now we're gonna talk about Doctor Who. I am a Whovian. I absolutely love Doctor Who, but it's largely no in regards to time travel. And we gotta kinda think about this. Time is a human construct. It's a way that we organize our lives in order for us to say, okay, at three o'clock I gotta do this. At four o'clock I gotta do this. So it's a way for us to organize our day to day in order to keep up with what we're doing, where we gotta be and what we gotta do. Um, so time acts differently <laughs> in different parts of the universe. And so, and we don't fully understand it completely. We only have um, theoretical, types of, um, or, you know, theoretical types of math in order to explain how we view time in different parts of the universe. Um, but still, it's a human construct, and all we really know that we have is now. And then with all of the potential different types of futures, you know, how are you going to hop into one or another? So we do have a little bit of um, multidimensional things. Yeah, especially close to black holes. Gravity can play a role in that too. So, you know, gravity has an effect on light as well. And we largely talk about, um, when we look at, you know, time, we also talk about light years. So light years can mean different things, especially if you got a black hole nearby, because light does not escape a black hole. So we have to consider, you know, also string theory and multi-dimensions and, and that sort of thing that we have a lot of possibilities, but we don't really understand a whole lot with that. 
Um, especially when we have certain subatomic particles that phase in and out of existence. We don't know where they go. We see them and then we don't. And so is that an instrumentation thing or is that a separate dimension? We have absolutely no idea, which makes it very, very, very difficult to consider time travel right now. But yes, that's pretty cool in that regard. So now I want to talk about possibilities and what Star Trek has done for us. Now I try not to get too involved in heavy sciencey Star Trek debates because people do get really angry when they go, oh this latest Star Trek, you know, film, you know, it's just not as scientifically accurate as like next gen. It's all made up. So I just I have to remind people, you know, dilithium and well like tri or they like trilithium crystals, they gotta look for it because that's what you know, it does their warp drive and you're like, okay, hold on a second, you know, trilithium crystals, even if they did exist, we don't necessarily know they would behave this way. And so one particular argument that somebody wanted to have with me was about the the very first reboot J.J. Abrams film of Star Trek that came out a few years ago. They were like, hey, you know, they were building the Enterprise on the planet. They would never do that. They would build it in space because that's easier. I'm like, well, how do you know they didn't engineer a particular device that beams up the entire ship or in pieces into space, but they needed to, you know, work on it on Earth. And so they just beam it up what piece by piece on up there. It's like, well, they didn't say that in the film, but how do you know? All they need to do is put in a sentence that says, um, well, we built this thingamajiggy that allows us to beam the entire ship into space. Wow, what a fantastic scientific find that was. I mean, you know, just one line of dialogue solves that entire problem. So you can't really debate the actual science in a particular show like Star Trek. But the thing that's important, though, is science followed suit and was sparked with imagination involving Star Trek to develop portable devices. So we had cell phones. The flip, flip phones looked an awful lot like the 1960s Star Trek communicators. And then you look at Next Gen. Um, Captain Picard often has a tablet that he looks at from time to time and then he sets down and he gets an actual book and he says, you know, I do like reading books, Paige, but I'm kind of with him on that. I don't really like reading off a tablet. It just, I, it's something way more gratifying to see how much you've read in a book on like the thickness of what you've been through rather than just the page number, but that's me. So we have tablets now and we have smartphones and we have communication devices. So we have a lot of portable devices. There's actually a tricorder now. There was um, a particular contest in order for scientists and engineers to get together to develop a tricorder. See, so, yep, see, there you go. So we're looking at this particular thing. We're like, hey, so Star Trek, wasn't scientifically accurate at the time, but now we have devices that it kind of reinforced like, hey, well, we don't have warp drive, but now we have all these cool little portable devices. So that's what made Star Trek really, really cool and, you know, continues to spark the imaginations of scientists and engineers. So let's talk about some other possibilities. You know, we've got things like The Martian, all right? Jurassic Park and Gattaca. I want to talk about these three films now. The Martian I really liked. It only broke physics a few times. Now I have to point out, my mother is a master gardener who loves astronauts, okay? She absolutely is in love with astronauts. I'm like, you have to watch this film, The Martian. It's pretty close to scientific accuracy. My mom couldn't get past the whole plants on Mars thing. Now I'm not a botanist. I have a basic understanding of plants. But my mom actually went to school, became a master gardener later on in her life, and was the president of the local group. If I want to know what I put in my yard, I ask her. That's just what I do. And she's like, you just can't, I don't see how he could plant stuff like that on Mars. You know, we don't understand the soil 100%. And so she goes into this whole nerd rant about how she doesn't think that they could grow things on Mars necessarily. Especially with the potatoes that he was trying to grow. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there going, Mom, you totally just nerded out on all this, you know. And, but this is also a, a woman who has a hard time suspending disbelief. She doesn't really enjoy things like Lord of the Rings because she couldn't get past the fact that the horse was named Bill and the guy's name is Aragorn. She's like, why would he name his horse Bill? So my mom is quite practical in that regard. So the Martian only breaks physics a little bit for that. But didn't he make the soy, soil? Yeah, so... Yeah, he did try, you know, with the organic materials, um, you know, with the poo. 
the poo from the individuals yes I think that was helpful again I don't know the soil content I suppose I could look at the latest NASA reports and see what kind of um, tests the rover has made in regards to that um, I don't know what other compounds are in that soil so I would have to kind of look but it was helpful nonetheless if anything it might have just been like a good case for that so I don't know I would have to go back and check on that I don't know a hundred percent with in regards to that but I think it's probably mostly clay but if it's clay it should still be all right at least the soil on Mars all right so Jurassic Park let's get into that one Jurassic Park now this would only be feasible if we look at DNA because DNA has a shelf life of about 10,000 years. It tends to fall apart right after that. It's a highly stable molecule, but it does tend to fall apart after about 10,000 years. So only organisms that have been extinct within that time frame we could actually bring back is their regular size type of organisms. Now, so like the woolly mammoths. The, they have um, fully, actual full intact fossils of the woolly mammoths with organic tissue. So we're able to extract DNA from that. And so from that regard, we're able to get um, enough, you know, of, of DNA in order to develop and generate um, an organism out of a lab. The problem with Jurassic Park in regards to dinosaurs, people are like, well, we have birds and we have reptiles. We could fill in the gaps like it talks about in this particular film. The problem is, is there's a lot of holes in that DNA. And so if you're going through and you're adding particular genes, whatever sequence is there, you don't know what used to be there 100% because we're talking about millions of years of changes. So over time, you might have something that is now in this particular organism that's doing this particular thing it might have been doing something else so the way that I kind of talk about genetics is much like computer coding so if you look at a computer code like a software code we have bits and bytes we have zeros and ones and that's essentially what makes up our computer code in that particular sequence it does a particular thing well in the genetic code we have nucleotides that are in sequence of threes all right, so three particular nucleotides will code for one amino acid. All right, so you have this long code. This one's one mean amino acid. This three is for one particular amino acid. This three is for another. This three is for another. This three is for another. So in sets of three, that kind of puts our proteins together. And this is, you know, proteins pretty much run what we do. Enzymes, hair, face, everything. So if we change that code, we could change the sequence of amino acids that could change what it does. So if we don't know what that code was there and we go through and we're like taking things out and putting things in, we could shift that reading frame. So instead of reading these three here, we've moved over one and now it's like a new set of three. That's kind of hard to explain here. So if I took like this word possibilities and then I add an extra O, it's now possibilities. It's a completely different word. If I drop this O, it's now PSS. If I put a U there, it's, it's possibilities, which means we probably need to go to the doctor. So that's the thing. We change these particular letters in here in our genetic code, we can end up with a completely different word. So there's no guarantee that that particular gene would do what it's supposed to do amongst all of the other letters involved. So that's the problem with Jurassic Park. We can't really go filling stuff in because it change, changes the sequence in itself. But one thing that is possible, if you've not seen Gattaca, I suggest you go check that film out right now because this is our potential future. Right now, there's legislation that's um, going up to Congress to allow employers to be, and they're, they're trying to develop this bill now to allow employers to be able to check your genetic code for potential problems. Now here's the issue with that. Just because you have a gene for a particular disease doesn't mean you will get that disease. Gattaca is a film that's based on a utopian society. Well, I say utopian. 
but the ability to be able to take the best traits from each parent to make nearly genetically perfect babies. So, guess what happens in the workforce? All of the nearly perfect humans are the ones that get the white collar jobs with the thinking brains type of thing, and then the people that are what they call faith babies that are not genetically engineered in a lab are the ones who get the more labor intensive jobs. It doesn't matter what their mental ability is. It doesn't matter what's going on. If they are not considered one of the genetically elite, they are discriminated against. So we already have issues with discrimination involving racism and sexism and that sort of thing. And it's already hard to prove. Now in this world, that type of discrimination is illegal, but it still happens through shaking somebody's hand, offering them a drink. They still run illegal genetic tests on people in this particular world, which keeps them from getting jobs. Now, the thing that's scary though, this is possibly our future because we're able to do gene editing right now and while it's not completely fallen over into humans through CRISPR technology, um, we haven't actually gotten to a point to where we can alter genes within people, but we can do it in lab mice. But it would re require a lot more of a particular protein for CRISPR for gene editing in people that could be potentially hazardous. So we haven't quite got there yet but the fact that they're wanting to screen DNA for individuals, employers, and allowing them to do that is problematic in itself because certain diseases like diabetes, a lot of that has environmental triggers. So if you're a healthy individual, if you eat properly and you exercise, you can actually reverse diabetes in some cases to where you no longer have it just by changing your lifestyle. So there's environmental triggers that are there that encourage you know, particular genes to be expressed. So just because you have a gene for a particular disease, depending on the disease, does not necessarily mean you will be affected by it. So that's what the problem is with Gattaca. Well, it's, that's, that's the closest thing we have to our future right now. So if you've not seen that film, check it out. This is what we're looking at really, really soon. So, what I want to talk about now is why sci-fi is important. Because imagination is more important than knowledge. And that's Albert Einstein. And the reason for that, we have a lot of technologies now. What are my thoughts on the Interstellar movie? Ha! <laughs> huh? I actually did not like Interstellar. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I didn't like Interstellar. I thought the black hole scene was pretty cool. Um, I did not necessarily agree with a lot of what was going on, especially when you're talking about um, the money that they were spending. They were essentially going to just let the world go to go to pot, you know? Um, yeah, I really didn't. Uh, and being a scientist myself, um, I'm picking up my fourth degree in May. I already have two undergrads, in one in chemistry, one in biology. I have a master's of arts that's in science education. And then now I'm picking up an analytical chemistry degree. And I work in, um, essentially in computational chemistry and cancer research. But the thing that I don't like about Interstellar is that all of the scientists just took this one guy's word. It's the total opposite of peer review. They're like, okay, so where are the, all the thinking people in NASA? We're all going to get together in this secret society, and we're going to just ship our DNA to other parts of the world because we're just going to send astronauts out there to like put the DNA of all these organisms, which, you know, sounds pretty cool, but they completely were like, we're like, we're going to forgo trying to save the planet we have. And they based everything just on one dude's vision. That is not science. <laughs> that is not science at all. That's like, there, there was like nobody there. And, you know, this one girl who's like, hey, we can fix our planet. We can do this. And he's like, yeah, no. You know, and it just... I couldn't get past that. I thought nobody would spend billions and billions of dollars to go and find another planet to put our DNA instead of saving the one we have, or at least having some kind of satellite station to transport people and make it, you know, more until we could sort out the oxygen problem because the earth does go through cycles. We see that, you know, and plants, you know, like we're losing the plants right now. 
in London, they're able to grow plants underground in labs in old parts of the London underground that aren't being used anymore. They're using them for hydroponic technology. And I'm saying, we got the tech in order to do this. We can actually get oxygen. We have robots that undergo photosynthesis. So it is possible for us to do this. But, you know, there was no ethics committee. There was no peer review. And I'm going, this is the complete opposite of science. This is like a madman that's running away with stuff. And everybody's just saying, okay. And I thought, that is not science. But it sparked a lot of um, interesting debates and got people asking questions, you know, like you're like, what do you think of Interstellar? What do you think of this? Well, I think it's cool in that it gets people talking about stuff and, and interacting and saying, okay, is this possible or not? Well, let's think about this. You know, what if this really happened? How could we solve it? Oh, wow, this is cool. That's why I think sci-fi is important because it allows us to sit and ask those questions. So that's what I got here. While much of sci-fi is not possible, the importance, the importance of it is that it lies in the imagination and it allows it to spark science and questions. We have scientists who are, you know, sometimes you're, as a scientist, you're just like, ah, oh, I'm all out of inspiration. And then you sit and watch a really cool sci-fi film and then all of a sudden, wow, I think I can do that. And then they sit there and then they, we all of a sudden we have smartphones and we have, you know, vehicles and we have the International Space Station and we've got a rover on Mars and then now we can see other planets that might hold life. How can we contact them? You know, can we do anything with that? So that's why I think, you know, sci-fi is important, even though a lot of it's not possible imagination is more important than knowledge because that's what sparks the questions in order for us to get the knowledge and that's kind of where I go with sci-fi in that so that's pretty neat I got my nerf gun I'm ready for the non-existent zombie apocalypse I hit three things that time I should get an award <laughs> but you know do you follow me on Twitter? I have way more interaction there. Facebookers tend to be a bit quieter in regards to um, interacting with me on Facebook. I mostly post articles on Facebook. But in Twitter, they ask me more direct questions. And so I do have a hashtag there that says, Hey, Scientist Mel. And that way I'm able to find questions if people have individual questions. And the reason why I like to do that is because... Um, you can Google information, but there's a lot of wrong information on the internet, and some sources aren't necessarily very good ones. And so that, you know, and I'm used to going through and with my research, oh, you do? Cool. All right. So I do like to have um, interaction there and allow people to be able to ask me questions. What are the latest findings in quantum physics? That was one that was asked me a few days ago. And so a lot of quantum is based in computational now. And so um, to be able to find reader-friendly type of articles, I know where to go for those sorts of things. So sometimes when you Google stuff, if you end up on a site that's just not reputable, you might get the wrong information. And I would much rather, you know, help people out and say, hey, check this out. This is a bit um, reader friendly. Me being a former high school teacher, I tend to, I'm already used to doing that. So this is something that's fun for me. But like, hey, look, check this out. You asked me about this. Guess what? I know a guy. <laughs> and then I send it that way. Oh, your first degree in physics. Physics made me cry. And I ain't ashamed to admit that. Darth Vader here. Man, physics. I probably could try to get an undergrad in physics. It probably would help me understand physical chemistry a bit better, but man, oh, you know what? Hey, I got my first degree in 2011 and I hadn't quit going to school since. So I went back, 2009, I went back um, and started school there um, at university. Well, I didn't start, I had dropped out. Life circumstances are kind of problematic sometimes especially when it comes to focusing on school because it takes so much of your time but yeah you know it's possible uh but physics was very hard for me because that's a that's quite a different way to think now isn't it to be able to take math and say but you know i when we got it's like the first semester 
how many forces on a pulley. I'm like, man, I don't even care. I don't care. <laughs> and then we got to the second semester it was like two electrons are moving in a field I'm like electrons I know that you know so then we got to electricity and magnetism and you know particles in that regard I was okay but the ball rolling down a hill stuff I'm like man I don't even know it's like you got friction okay and then you got this going you know it's just oh I'm like no I don't care can we talk about the grass? Because I know photosynthesis. <laughs> so I was like, can we talk about that? I could talk about the wavelengths, you know, of light and stuff. I can do that, you know. But that wasn't what Physics 101 was. And I got calculus down, but trig, well, I just... Ooh, I took trig-based physics. Mm-mm. I hated it. I hated it. But I understand it a bit better now after having had physical chemistry. Physical chemistry was fun. It was all the different derivations of the ideal gas law and how it applied to Maxwell's equations. Man, yes, it's like math, 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 math. I'm like, oh God, I'm pretty sure you made up variables that don't exist. <laughs> so, like the partial derivatives. Oh man, I kind of I kind of really wish I had taken like Calc 2 and 3. I only took Calc 1, but Calc 3 is certainly needed for physical chemistry. God, when you like Maxwell's, um, Maxwell's equations where it was comparing um, things with um, constant pressure, constant temperature, constant volume. Yes, it's just, ooh, that's nuts. Maxwell, Maxwell was freaking brilliant. But one interesting book... Um, I'm trying to think. He, um, his thought experiment involving Maxwell's demon is a lot of fun, especially if you enjoy um, information theory. Information theory is a lot of fun in regards to trying to understand how in, an, in a universe where we have an increased amount of chaos, you know, universe is going to bits, but we still have organization. How is that possible? How is it that we have DNA? How is it possible that we have data stored, you know, stored data and stored energy? <clears throat> These are all forms of organization. Now, technically speaking, we shouldn't have such organization, you know. We should be going to bits, you know. But the information theory that Maxwell's demon provides in his thought experiment is essential to where we can have this organization without breaking the second law. Ah, yeah, so that's pretty cool if you um, should check that out. Um, I think it's called The Touchstone of Life. That's a fun book. So The Touchstone of Life where it talks about um, Maxwell's Demon and all of the different information theory as it applies to computational aspects of science and biochemistry that we see in the living world. So and how we're able to have this without breaking the second law. So that's kind of fun. You're welcome. This has been a fun chat. Um, so I'm going to post a poll on Twitter soon about what the next topic is going to be. So all of this topic was voted by the viewers. Like, we want you to talk about this. And I'm like, okay. And so I always have my videos here. I also have them on Periscope. And I at least upload one of these, um, either Facebook or Periscope, to YouTube. So they're there as well. So you have three different places. And the Facebook's always different from the Periscope broadcast so that's just I guess personal preference so um and I'll post a poll on Twitter and all of the um topics are viewer generated so somebody want elephants have lost every week for a month so <laughs> I might have to do elephants next week because people are screaming to talk about elephants elephants <laughs> Because it was pretty close. So elephants have been on the on the list every week since I've been doing this. Which has been, a, I think this is episode six now. So six weeks of elephants losing. <laughs> but I suppose I will sign off for now. Because I'm a space cowboy for this space sci-fi episode. And I'll be back on. I normally broadcast on Saturdays, but since I was at the Science March on Saturday, I was broadcasting today. So next Saturday, I will be back on at um, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook 
and 10 a.m. Central Standard Time on Periscope. So thank you for the chat. This is a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, you can ask me here or on Twitter. Enjoy your day. Have a super awesome one. Bye.